Hello and welcome back to a new session from the teaching series on divine healing. Uh, today we're going, we're continuing with the, on the second big chapter, God's will on healing, with the subchapter healing is included in the gospel or healing in the New Testament. We discussed last time, if you remember, why did Jesus heal while he was on earth and then healing in the Old Testament. And we saw the will of God and the heart of God to heal his people even from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant. And now we're moving more to the gospel, to, the, to, the, uh, to redemption and to atonement uh, that Jesus did on the cross. And we will see that healing, physical healing is included in the gospel, in the atonement or in the redemption, side by side with forgiveness of sin. Exactly what we finished off in the last session uh, in the Old Testament in, uh, in Psalm 103 verses 2 to 3 where we were saying that the benefits, do not forget any of his benefits, that he forgives all your iniquities and he heals all your diseases. Now physical healing is the right and the responsibility of every Christian, not of pastors, teachers or prophets or People, people with special callings and anointing. It's the responsibility, it's the right and responsibility of every believer. If you are a believer in Christ, you have the right. Did you hear me? You have the right. Jesus Christ gave us the right of the cross. God gave us the right. We didn't force him. Nobody forced him. He gave us the right to be healed and to minister healing to others. That's exciting. And a responsibility to be healed. It's your responsibility. It's not his responsibility to be healed and to minister healing to others. One of the biggest tactics of the devil in our days is to shift, even through us, is to shift responsibility back on God. For why did people didn't get healed? Why things didn't work the way we expected? Why did God allow this? No, God didn't allow anything. You allowed it. Christians have a very high responsibility because God has already done everything that he could have done. He paid for all sin and for all the effects of sin through Jesus Christ. He gave his most precious possession. He gave us eternal life. He gave us salvation. He gave us his word. And he gave us his Holy Spirit. He did everything that he could have done. He recreated us. He gave us a spirit of faith. He gave us a spirit of power, of holiness, of wisdom, of uh, a sound mind, a spirit of, of truth. The Holy Spirit is in us. He gave us everything. Now it's our responsibility to work out what he has done inside of us. That great salvation that he has brought into our hearts, into our spirit here. It's our responsibility to bring it out by faith in the word, in what he has done. So it's our responsibility. It's not God's responsibility. I know it's a hard, it's a hard uh, uh, pill to swallow, but that's the truth. That's the truth. It's our responsibility and God helps us even through his spirit. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit to help us. To, to, to produce those results and to bring healing to ourselves and to, to manifest healing to ourselves and to other people. You know, you are a walking billboard. From the moment you became a, became a Christian, a, a born-again believer, you are a walking billboard and a walking testimony for the world. So what do you want to advertise? The works of the devil or the works of God? So it's one of the two. You will either carry and show to the world the works of darkness in you. That's through sins, through sinful acts, deeds, but also through sickness, through lack, through poverty. That's advertising sin, advertising the devil. And we are called to advertise, to proclaim God's excellencies, to proclaim his his power to proclaim, to manifest his power and to proclaim to people how good he is, how full of mercy, how full of power, how full of grace he is and how much he loves people and he wants to heal people and he wants to, to has provided, he has provided his power for everyday needs, his life, 
his eternal life i was talking in the last session the life which can be applied for multiple needs in our lives everything we need is in his life that he has put in our spirits and divine healing is included as i mentioned in previous sessions is included in redemption or in salvation or in atonement but atonement is less than salvation salvation is more wholesome is more comprehensive atonement was a term of the old testament where sins were not really taken away were just covered that was atonement jesus in a way did atonement but he didn't just covered our sin he removed our sins he removed our sicknesses so divine healing is included in redemption and god made as you, as you know god made man physical and spiritual a physical spiritual being so redemption has to be both physical and spiritual and the first part of our physical redemption is divine healing that god has provided for us here on earth the second part will be our glorified bodies which will be renewed when jesus will come again but our spirit has been completely recreated our minds are catching up are renewed and our body are healed our bodies can be healed while we are here on earth sin and sickness as i mentioned are two fruits from the same tree or better said sickness is a result of sin man's sin caused sickness and disease before adam's sin there were, there were sickness and disease were not in the world they came in through sin so everything that came in through sin it's from darkness however sickness was not and is not caused by a, by an individual specific sin you are not sick because you did something or you sinned or you you yeah there are things that we can do destructive things that we can do habits uh, to to hurt ourselves but sickness per se doesn't come because of a specific sin that you did in your life sickness is an effect of sin in general the sin that we are born with from our father uh, adam and the fact that healing is included in redemption it's the most important thing about divine healing why because if physical healing was included in redemption that then we are as free to proclaim it as we are to preach salvation from sin they are on the same same place and if healing is not true then also salvation from sin any sin anyone anywhere anytime is not true right why have you seen heaven you believe in salvation you receive christ in your heart but have, have you ever seen heaven no you believed without seeing but if healing is something that we can see here and if healing is not true then how can you know that salvation and salvation from hell in the future life is also true right have you seen god no I mean, some people probably had some visions and saw god but there are very few but your faith is based on something that you haven't seen and if healing is not true then also salvation is not true and I, I was saying in a past session that it is easier to believe for forgiveness of sin because it's something of the past jesus died and it's something of the future jesus will come but it's a little bit more difficult to believe for the present for healing in the present because it, it you need to see something and when you don't see it then you start changing your theology that healing is not for today and his perfect will is not always to heal but his perfect will is always to heal let's begin by reading a first passage about healing in the gospel in the atonement in matthew uh, matthew chapter 8 verses 16 to 17 I'm reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any translation that you have. Uh, it will complete what I'm reading and you will understand it better. Let's read it together. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So first of all, we notice that he healed all who were sick. No qualifications, no restrictions, no disclaimers. He healed all who were sick. I love that about God. He's so inclusive. He makes such blank statements without qualification. He healed all who were sick. Why? In order to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet 
has said so hundreds of years before that he where in Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 we'll read it in a moment he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses the word sick here from verse 16 Matthew 8 16 comes from the Greek word kakos which means sickness plague calamity or to be in a bad shape bad state and a few parallel New Testament passages using the same Greek word in relation to physical sickness are in Luke 7, verse 2, where the centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick, kakos, and about to die. Why am, why am I mentioning the Greek word? Just to make to assure you that here this verse is talking about physical sickness and nothing else, not emotional, spiritual sickness. It's physical sickness. This centurion slave... The slave of this centurion that came to Jesus, he was sick, kakos, and he was about to die. And the same term is used in Matthew 8, 16, that he healed all who were kakos. And another, other passages that use the same term, uh, if you, whenever you have, you have time, you are welcome to read them. It's in Matthew 4, 24, chapter 9, verse 12, Matthew, and Matthew Chapter 14, verses, verse 35. Another word. The word. I'll take every word. The word infirmities in verse 17, where it says, He took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. The word infirmities comes from the Greek asteneia, which means physical weakness, illness, sickness, or disease. The exact sense used here is impairment of normal physiological function affecting part or all of an organism. That's what infirmity is, especially understood according to the resulting weakness or caused by illness. And parallel passages using the same Greek word are Luke chapter 5 verse 15, Luke 13 verses 11 to 12, and Acts chapter 28. 28 verse 9. Another word, the last word from this passage, he bore our sicknesses. The word sicknesses, verse 17, comes from the Greek nosos, and its primary meaning is physical sickness, malady, disease, illness. Parallel New Testament passages using the same Greek word are Luke 7 21 and Luke 9 verse 1. Now let's read. Uh, the passage that this uh, Matthew 8 16 is quoting from Isaiah 53 verse 4 to 5 let's read it together surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So we see in, the, in these two passages from Matthew 8 and Isaiah 53, that what Jesus did, meaning he healed all who were sick, kakos, was actually the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, where it says that Jesus has borne our griefs and sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. We, we are healed. And the, here now we have Hebrew words. In New Testament we have Greek, but here we have Hebrew. The Hebrew word for griefs, just to, to assure you that here is not talking about being upset or depression or emotional thing. It's talking about sickness, physical sickness. The Hebrew word for griefs in verse 4 is koli, and its first meaning is sickness. The other secondary meanings are affliction, disease grief illness sick and a few parallel old testament passages using the same hebrew word in the context of physical sickness include deuteronomy 7 verse 15 first kings 17 verse 17 2 kings chapter 1 verse 2 2 kings uh, chapter 13 verse 14 if you read all those passages you will see that the same hebrew word kali is used in a context of physical sickness. So grief, koli, is sickness. Its first meaning is sickness, along beside others, other meanings. Then we take the word sorrows. The word sorrows, the Hebrew word sorrows, is makob, 
which means pain, sorrow, suffering. In a parallel Old Testament passage using passages using the same Hebrew word in relation to physical pain, a job Chapter 33, verse 19. We know that Job really experienced physical pain. Uh, chapter 33, verse 19. So, Makob, it's physical pain as well. So, if some Christians don't have, don't have a problem with healing in general. So, we know that some Christians, not all, most Christians have a problem with healing. Uh, they say it's not for today. Uh, we have to endure. It's a hidden will of God. And we will take one by one all these lies of the devil and we'll put them down. But most, uh, many Christians don't believe in healing. Some believe that don't have a problem with healing in general. They kind of believe, but when they start praying for healing, you know that they don't believe actually. Because you, the words they use, the way they pray shows that they don't really believe, don't, don't have an understanding of how healing works, how faith works. But another big problem besides all this is we have a problem with all. It seems too radical. And because we don't always see it, uh, healing manifesting when we pray, we, have a, we struggle with that, that. It's not for all. It's not for all sicknesses, not for everybody, not all the times. But Jesus healed all who were sick and that and that all should be healed all who are sick and all should be healed and it's usually because they as i said you prayed for someone he didn't get healed or she didn't get healed healed and then you begin to believe that it's not for all so you believe that it's not for all and the same thing is with salvation so the salvation of jesus Paid for the sins of all people. This analogy with our salvation of sins helps very much. Salvation from sin is paid for all sins, all people, anytime, anywhere. Right? Anybody can get saved, but not everybody does. Right? Why? You, and can you blame God for that if they don't get saved? Why? You cannot blame God because God already paid the price. But why don't, doesn't anybody get healed, uh, get saved? Why doesn't everybody accept God and Jesus? The price for healing has been paid exactly like the price for salvation from sin. But will everybody be healed? No, exactly like salvation. Will everybody be saved? God wants for all to be saved. He wishes for all to be saved. But not everybody gets saved. And not everybody gets healed. Why? Is God to blame? Is God the, the responsible one? No. God doesn't decree healing at the individual level. I will say it again. God does not decree healing at the individual level. He doesn't sit in heaven and just flip a switch on who gets healed or, or who, who doesn't. He doesn't know like this will get healed, this will not. This will, oh, let's see how much they pray. Or let's see how holy they are. And then I'll grant healing. No, 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 no. He flipped the switch in favor of healing once and for all when Jesus paid for it with his stripes. He flipped the switch. He said, I want healing for everybody. It's not just individuals, not for certain individuals and then for others, no. God paid for ill healing once and for all for anyone, anywhere, anytime, and any sickness. And God has already granted healing for anyone, anywhere, anytime. If there is sickness and disease in a person, it's either because we have not received it or we haven't ministered it. So that's the only reason. Of course, sickness and disease comes from the devil. But the reason it stays there, we, it stays there because we didn't repel it. We didn't refuse it by the power of God. We didn't destroy it by the, uh, the power of God. Let's continue to read another passage from Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. It says this, and it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. 
most of us know that God can do anything and heal anyone, but we are not sure if God is willing to do it for us personally when we are sick. And I, I, I kind of uh, said that in the uh, past session, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. However, God is always willing to heal. Say it for yourself. God is always willing to heal me. He always wants to heal me, to cleanse me. And that has been on his heart all along, always, from, it, from, be, from the beginning. In the case of the man full of leprosy in this passage that we just read, notice that Jesus didn't say, Father, you know, we have this leprosy here, and you know, he's in a bad condition, Father. You know, and you know, Lord, he's got problems, Lord. I mean, look at his ear. It fell off. Oh, that's terrible. Lord, we, we just pray for him. And look at his nose. That must have hurt. Look at his nose. So Lord, we just pray. You know, you know what's best for him. Um, Lord, we, we pray for healing, but we just trust you. <laughs> Probably you're laughing because I, I barely <laughs> refrain myself. But that's how we pray. And notice that Jesus never prayed like that. He, di he didn't pray like that ever. The apostles didn't pray like that ever. The Bible doesn't show even a case or, or an encouragement that we should pray like this. Oh Lord, you know, no, I have mercy on this. Oh, you know, you know how bad it is, Father. But we trust you. We know your will. We we trust in you. That's that's not a biblical a biblical prayer, and we still do it. Why? Because it's it's been done for a long time, and we just copy it and do it, and that that kind of prayer doesn't reveal faith it's not faith in what god has done it basically putting the blame and responsibility on god oh god we just trust you so if it doesn't happen it's your fault it's not my fault it's your fault not isn't that right <laughs> what is god saying let's continue with first peter 2 24 i don't want to offend anyone it's not evil i don't have any bitterness in my heart because I but I, I I'm just trying to show you that we need to change we need to change our way of thinking our way of prayer and take the word of God seriously first Peter 2 24 who himself bore our sin in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed by whose stripes I was healed you see here, the same thing from Isaiah is reiterated in this passage in the New Testament, in 1 Peter, but in a different sense, in, in a different tense. Remember, in Isaiah 53, it was, by his stripes we are healed. And here it says, by his stripes we were healed. So something happened between Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2.24, right? Something significantly happened. What, what happened? What happened? Jesus died on the cross. So something significant happened between Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8, where Jesus was alive, and 1 Peter 2.24. Jesus died on the cross. So if here we are healed, and Jesus proved that, here in 1 Peter we were healed in Jesus' sacrifice. You might say, if that's true, why do Christians get sick? And are not automatically healed. That's the question. Why doesn't everybody get healed? Or why do we get sick? Even get sick as Christians. If we are a new creation in Christ, why do we get sick? For the same reason why not, not, why not all people are saved. Why? Because everybody needs to apply faith to Jesus' sacrifice for themselves. That's what you did when you were saved. To personalize in order to be saved. You took the word of God, Romans 10, 9, 10, and proclaimed Jesus as Lord. You believed in resurrection and you, and then you were saved. In the same manner, the same goes for healing. Healing is available, but you need to apply faith on Jesus' sacrifice for your personal healing. But if you didn't even know that healing was paid in Jesus' sacrifice, as many Christians don't know today, then how can you believe? Because you don't even know, you don't have understanding. But then, even after you get understanding, you have to start saying and believing. Belief doesn't happen overnight. It's, it happens in a long time until you build conviction on what the Word 
of God says. Because your mind has all kinds of unbelief, all kinds of strongholds built in time. People's opinions, uh, Christians' opinions, pastors, all kinds of uh, wrong thinking that needs to be taken away so that the word of God, good beliefs are built upon. So if these are strongholds and they are not easily broken down. We need, you, that, that's why it's a fight of faith. Because you need to, uh, the word of God, which you don't see, has to become more real than what you see, what you hear through your five senses. And that's, that's the fight. It's a fight of the mind to, to, to stay on what God says, no matter what happens around you or what you see. And then you see the manifestation of the power of God. Some may say that the healing in the above passage in 1 Peter 2.24, it's only spiritual or emotional and it's not physical. And that is not true. And I'll show you why. If you compare the word healed from Isaiah 53 verse 5, from the Greek Septuagint translation, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the, the Greek word from the Septuagint from Isaiah 53 verse 5, with the Greek word for healed in 1 Peter 2.24, they are the same. So the, the word for healed, he, we are healed in Isaiah 53 verse 5, by his stripes we are healed is the same word, Greek word from 1 Peter 24, where it says, by his stripes we were healed, which refers, refers to sickness, physical sickness. It is the Greek word, you know what's the Greek word? That's the same in both places, is yaomai. It means to cure and to heal, and it's only used in reference to physical healing. It is never used in reference to spiritual healing. But, Whenever you were born, if you want to go with spiritual healing, whenever you were born again, you didn't receive spiritual healing. Did you hear me? You didn't receive spiritual healing. You were not healed in your spirit. You were recreated. You were born again. Your spirit was completely recreated. So you are not healed, spiritually healed. So even if you want to take spiritually, spiritual healing, that's not possible. You cannot be healed spiritually. Amen? So here it talks about physical healing of our sicknesses and disease. Let's move on to Romans with another passage from Romans 8 verse 32. We're still talking about healing in the gospel, healing in redemption. Romans 8 32 says this. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. So God sacrificed us for us, for us all his most precious possession, which was his son. Now the Bible says here, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? What are all things? Healing is one of those things. All the other things that come from God. He gives them to us freely with him. When he died on the cross with him, with Jesus Christ, came all the other things freely given to us. And healing is one of those things. Saying that God doesn't heal today anymore is the same thing as saying that healing is much higher or much, uh, it's much more precious than God's only son. I will say that again. Saying that God doesn't want to heal today, it's saying that healing is more precious than God's only son. Because God already gave his only son that he loved so much. John 3.16 says, he sacrificed his most precious possession. How much more he's willing to give us healing, physical healing. Because physical healing is less precious than his son. God <clears throat> already sacrificed his only son. So he, why would he retain healing from us? Why? Because he already showed us how much he loves us and how much he loves people. Luke 5, 17 to 26. Do you love the word of God? Do you like the word of God? It builds faith when you hear the truth, what God has done, what God wants for us, what his heart for us. Luke 5, 17, 26. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by 
who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who, who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven in you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So what is Jesus saying here? Something similar to what he, the Bible says in Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. In other words, it says this, God, guys, both forgiveness of one's sins and or healing them of sickness are impossible to accomplish, humanly speaking. Both forgiving sin, to forgive sins and to heal sicknesses, is they are both impossible to do without supernatural, in a, human, in a human strength. So in order to prove to you, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, in order to prove to you that I can forgive sins as well, I will heal this person physically. So that when you see, by doing one miracle that is equally required for forgiveness, forgiving sins, I hope that you will realize that I also have authority to forgive sins. So if they are both on the same side, both are, both are impossible, both are supernatural works. So what Jesus is saying, because forgiveness of sin is something that you don't see, it's not tangible. He says this, I will heal this sickness to show you and to prove to you that I can also forgive sins. Right? Because they, are, they both require miracle, both require the power of God. That's what this passage here says. Because he says in verse 23, which is easier? Both, they are not easy to, to say your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk. They are both impossible. But so that you know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins, so that you will know that Jesus has power to forgive sins, I will heal. He said to them, rise up and walk. So he proved by exactly what I, saying, what I was saying in reverse. If healing is not true, then salvation is not true as well. So what he's saying, if I cannot heal this person, then I cannot forgive sins either. So when he healed that sick, the lame uh, uh, man, he proved that he can forgive sins too. <clears throat> so both forgiveness of sins and healing of sicknesses are on the same place in God's heart. And what's interesting here is that the Pharisees didn't, have, didn't seem to have a big problem with Jesus healing that man physically. They didn't have a problem with that. Their problem was that Jesus was proclaimed that he forgives sins. Today is the other way around in the, church, in the body of Christ. We don't have a problem with forgiveness of sins, but we have a problem with physical healing. Do you see that? They had a problem with forgiveness of sin, not with physical healing. Now we have a problem with physical healing, but we don't have with forgiveness of sin. We reverse the thing. And as, as I said, it's probably because forgiveness of sin is unseen, is not tangible, but physical healing uh, needs to happen in front of your eyes so that you would believe. Let's read one more passage from Romans 6 verse 14. It's powerful, powerful verse. I recommend that you memorize this. This is one of uh, my favorite verses that I memorized, I personalized, I always declared in my, in my prayer. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Sin does not have dominion over me because I am in Christ. And when I say sin, everything that came with sin doesn't have dominion over me. Sickness doesn't have dominion over me. 
Poverty doesn't have dominion over me. Curse doesn't have dominion over me. Fear doesn't have dominion over me. Worry doesn't have dominion over me. Let's read one more. Romans 5, 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. See, if you receive the abundance of grace and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you reign in life. You are supposed to reign in this life, not in the future life. There we will reign, but it will be a physical, visible reign. Here we reign not over people, but over the devil, over the, our, the, the works of the devil, over sickness, over poverty, over curse. We reign over, we change circumstances by the power of the word of God. We have a blessed life. If you remember the people of Israel, when there were plagues in Egypt, they were in the middle of Egypt, but they in Goshen. But their part where they were staying, no plague was coming near that place. That's how we are today in this world. The kingdom of God is invisible, but powerful. And we, we reign in life. We reign because we have the life of God. We reign through the life of God that he has put in us. That eternal life, that life that, that is like the electric power, we can apply it to our needs that we need in this world. And we reign on top of the circumstances. This is not a metaphor. This is, nothing, I, this is not something ideal that we will never reach or a mirage. This is something real that you can live and you can start living every day of your life to reign over circumstances, like really reign and see circumstances fall down at your feet. See things changed, say in your body, in your, in your world, in your family, in your circle of friends, family. Believers reign in life over all the negative circumstances and over sickness. But when you believe, it's not automatically. You reign when you believe that you reign and that you are a king in the heavenly places. In the spiritual realm, you are a king. You have the authority of the king. You sit at the right, you are the right hand of the father here on earth. You know, I hear on some, I saw some videos where some demons that uh, possessed some people were speaking for people that, oh, I am, I am great. I sit at the left side of the devil or I sit uh, of the right hand of Satan. And they were bragging about this. How much more you sit at the right hand of the Father. Your authority, your position, your rank is the right hand of the Father in Christ Jesus. So wherever you go, you go with that authority, with that rank that is recognized by angels, by Satan, by all the forces and cohorts of darkness. When they see you and when you believe, they have to run away. 2 Corinthians 5.18 Verses uh, 5, 18, and 19 says this. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is this reconciliation? The ministry of reconciliation actually means to distribute life and it functions at three levels. In the spirit, reconciliation, reconciliation in the spirit, which is salvation from sins and rebirth. Reconciliation, we preach the gospel, yeah? We preach the gospel and the spirit of people is reborn when they believe. So that's reconciliation in the spirit. Reconciliation in the soul which means deliverance from any demonic influence, from any mental struggles, strongholds. And the third level, in the body. Healing is the ministry of reconciliation that God has entrusted us for our physical body. So we have the spirit, which is reborn. We have the soul, which is delivered. And we have the body, which is healed. The healing is part of the reconciliation that God has committed to us. That what I'm speaking now here is the word of reconciliation on healing. It's the gospel on, of healing. Amen. I think we have time to do one more subsection. I we finish here the, the healing, including the gospel, and we move forward to the fourth 
subsection of this big, big chapter, God's Will on Healing. And this subsection is entitled, Same Works as Jesus. And as the title says, we are called to do this, at least the same works that Jesus did. And let's see that in John chapter 14, verses 10 to 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, says Jesus, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So you see this verse? It says that we are supposed to do at least the works of Jesus and then greater works as well. Not stop there. We are supposed to do to start from where Jesus was, what he did. And we know that he did so many miracles that the Bible says that if, if they were all written, the world will not fit all the books that were of the things that God, that Jesus did on earth. So why do, are we called to do those? Because Jesus went to be with the Father. That's what the pastor said. Jesus lived here, but he went to be with the Father. He's no longer here to do those things. But we are called to do those things. To do the same things, the same works that Jesus did and much more. Because we have access to much more now. Uh, to technology, we have the Holy Spirit. We have so much, much more greater works. And whenever we ask or demand something says the verse 14, to happen, it happens in the name of Jesus here on earth. And when this happens, what happens also? The Father is glorified. Whenever sick people are healed, it brings, it brings joy to you and glory to God. God is glorified when people are healed, not when they endure it, not when you endure it. God is not glorified by you enduring sickness. God is glorified when you are healed. When you put his word to work and you apply his healing that he bought in Jesus Christ. John 16 verse 7. You see, I read a lot of Bible. I don't do a lot of things. I just read the Bible and make connections that maybe you, you didn't see before. Different connections between different concepts. So that to help you uh, build a framework, to help you see certain things, certain revelations. And then you can... Or you can from there, you can receive more from the Holy Spirit. Do analogies, uh, uh, implications of a certain beliefs in your in your day-to-day -day life. That's what we need to do to personalize the word and see the implications. Not forget the word of church. We take the word and then we see all the implications, all the consequences in our day-to-day -day life. John 16 verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So healing people is not a spiritual gift given by God to only a few people. I know God has given gift, the gifts, God, uh, gifts, gifts of faith, gifts of healing to certain people like Smith Wiggles or like uh, other people uh, of God in the past and even today. But what I'm talking here is not a gift. I'm talking about the right and the responsibility of every believer to grow in faith and to do to manifest healing and to minister healing all the time. That's what I'm talking. It's not something that God just puts in you and then it just works for you no matter what you do, no matter if you renew your mind or not, or if you believe the word of God. Yeah, people that have a gift of healing or a faith, you when you read about them, you see that they just prayed, they didn't even have faith, they didn't have it was a surprise for them, and people got healed. That's a gift. It's not you growing in faith. And that's a difference. And God's gifts are not God's best. That's, that God doesn't want us to operate by gifts. He wants to operate as believers in Christ Jesus. And I probably I'll, I'll talk about this later on. Matthew chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. So, the, so Jesus sends the Holy Spirit so that we can do what he did. Let's read it together. When they persecute you in the city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. 
A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. His master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If, if they have called the master of the house Be Belzebub, Belzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? And Luke chapter 6 verses 39 to 40. And he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. What is the idea here in these two passages? That we need to look like Jesus and do what Jesus did to be like our teacher, at least like our teacher. You cannot look like Jesus and not operate in power. Can I say it again? You cannot look like Jesus and not operate in power. Because if you take away healing and power out of the ministry of Jesus, you are messing with the DNA of Jesus, the DNA of God. And it is in his DNA to deliver, to heal, to set free. And we need to have the same DNA, the DNA, the footprint, the, the, the DNA. What is the DNA? It's your unique, uh, unique print. The DNA of God, the DNA of Jesus was to heal, to set free, to, to, to help people. And that's the DNA we need to, we have as children, as sons and daughters in God. We need to have the same DNA, activate the same DNA. And you, you might have heard people sometimes say, oh yeah, but that was Jesus or those were the disciples. It's not us. That, those things were just for them. And there will always be somebody. Like, it's not me, but somebody, the disciples or Jesus or Smith Wigglesworth were, uh, I say about Smith Wigglesworth, because, Smith Wigglesworth because I like him, but there's also John G. Lake, there are uh, Lester Sumner, there are all other people like Ora Roberts, Benny Hinn, there are people that healed other people and operated in, the, in power. But the devil has at least two tactics to stop you from releasing power. The first tactic is by putting you down at first. When you start hearing about healing, about the word of God, he will come through other people saying, who do you think you are? You are young. You don't know. I mean, look, I mean, our pastors, our fathers, our, like the whole Christian tradition, tradition has been going for so many years and these things were not preached. And now you find this new thing. So that's the tactic of the devil. The first one is to stop, to put you down. But if he doesn't manage to do that, he will apply the second tactic, the second strategy where he starts, after you start getting victories and you see healing manifested, he starts pushing you forward. How? You are now someone important. You are, everybody should listen to you now. You are the anointed one. You have the words of life. You are special. So what does the devil do? He comes with pride. And that's the second tactic that he will second tactic that he will try to destroy you when you start operating in healing. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 15. <clears throat> we have a few more verses. And he himself gave some to, to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, to and, fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. So why do we have pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets here on earth with us in the church? They are gifts to the church. Why? With the purpose of training us, training you into mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. For what? For here on earth or for the future life? Fullness of Christ, they are here on earth to train you in the fullness of Christ, to walk in the fullness of Christ here on earth. That's where we are heading. That's where the church is heading. We're talking about tribulation and we're like looking to escape from here. 
but uh, as we come closer to the end times, God will not be, be below. He will strengthen his church to be more powerful than the devil, more powerful than the kingdom of darkness. And he, that's where we're heading. And we are to grow into him in every way, to reveal him in us. So I like how the, the, uh, the pastor says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Fullness of Christ. Not littleness. Fullness of Christ. We are to operate in that fullness of Christ. Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are predestined to be conformed to the image of God's son, Jesus. So we are in the section, the same works as Jesus. Let's read a few more passages and we're coming to a close. Four more, four more passages. First John chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. Let's read it together. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, out himself also to walk just as he walked. We, we are to walk in the same way that Jesus walked. How? Verse 5 says, keep keeping his word, keeping his word and his commandments. Yes, it can refer mostly to holiness, but keeping his word is also keeping his word and promises in all areas of our lives. That's how we walk as he walked. So Jesus didn't walk just in holiness. Yes, he didn't have any sin. But how did he walk? The verse here says, he, we, he, he who says he abides in him, out himself, he must himself also walk just as he walked. Just as Jesus walked. He walked in power. He walked in healing. He walked in raising the dead, in um, delivering people, casting out devils. And that's what we are called to walk in. 1 John 4.17 that's another powerful verse that I recommend that you would uh, memorize and declare it for yourself. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world, not the future world. As Jesus Christ is in all his fullness. So are we in this world. Not on a promissory note. Not on like a yes but no. And I'll talk about the already and not yet theology later on. We are indeed. in. We have exactly the same power. The same capability that Jesus Christ had and has right now. John 3.34 says this. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the Spirit by measure. And this passage, we know it talks about Jesus, the Son of God. That God sent Jesus to speak the words of God. And that God didn't give him the Spirit by measure. He gave him the fullness of the Spirit. But now we go later on in John 20, verse 21, where it says this. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. How did the Father send him? We saw in chapter 3, verse 34. So he sent him to speak the words of God. And he didn't give him the Spirit by measure. So that means if he, as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sent us. It means that he gave us the Spirit not by measure. He gave us the fullness of the Spirit. In the same way that the Father sent Jesus... Then Jesus sent the disciples and he sent us in the power of the Spirit and to do the same things that Jesus did, the same words that Jesus did. And I think we'll, we'll uh, stop here today because I gave you a lot, a lot of verses, a lot of things to think about. And I, I, I encourage you to take time to meditate on them, to, to build. That, that's how you grow in faith. Meditate on these things. Make connections. Uh, see how it does apply to, into your life, into your day-to-day -day life. Start 
personalizing, start speaking those words because they apply to you. So today we talked about healing in the gospel, in the New Testament, and about that we are called to do the same things, the same words, at least, that Jesus did. We are to walk as Jesus Christ walked. We are uh, Christ on earth. Jesus Christ is in us and we are in Jesus Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Until we see each other next time, may God bless you and, uh, and grow you, establish you in faith in Christ. Amen.